Warning, there's going to be spoilers for Without a Paddle. <laughs> great, great documentary. And then... <laughs> it's not a documentary. And then... I'm Sky. I'm Kylie. And welcome to Histories, Mysteries, and Conspiracies. Does my voice sound a little crackly to you? It seems a little, um... Like I've been talking all day? No, it haven't. seems a little shrill. Shrill? Yeah. I was gonna say the opposite. Like it sounds like I'm sick or something. No. And today I'm talking about the unsolved mystery of D.B. Cooper. So... D.B. Cooper. Kyler, tell me what you know about D.B. Cooper. Not, okay, let me start by saying not who you think D.B. Cooper is, because I know you you think you know. I do know. But I I, watched we're going to talk about that. I watched the History Channel we're show about talk, this. I got this. I got this. So um, what we're going to talk about, talk about the details of the incident. So what do you know about the incident? Okay, so there's these there's these three kids, right? And they've been friends for their entire lives. And they've always wanted... Are you going to tell the story without a paddle? I am absolutely not. So they, they've been <laughs> friends their entire lives. And they're, they're trying to hunt down this money from this famous hijacking. And they, um, they get through... This is the plot of Without a Paddle. They get through so many shenanigans. And they find nudists... And this is this is one hundred percent without a paddle. <laughs> they find Burt Reynolds. I okay, think. What, what about the money? How did the money? Where where does the famous hijacking? Tell me about that. So in the movie, in fabulous film, not a sponsor. Um, <laughs> like they'd be sponsoring podcasts. A movie that's like fifteen years old. It's fine. Don't worry about <laughs> it. So basically, Dak Shepard's poor, right, and he needs money. So he. This is still not the hijack. Concocts a plan to find the money. Kyler, you're fired. <laughs> but anyway, if no. we're if we're trying to if we're trying to be if we're trying to be legit about this, so um, there's this guy. I don't know how I went by the name of DB Cooper, but sure. Um, was it like a cardigan he was wearing? We'll get to how he's known as DB Cooper. Let's just go with that. Um, so this dude wearing a fancy cardigan hijacks a plane, basically, with all these people on it. Now he's flying away, or like he he makes them he makes them land, and he lets off every single person, with the exception of the pilot and like a flight attendant. And he says, "I need you to meet me at this airport, and you got to give me like I don't know the amount of money. Let's just say it's like fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more. Let's just say it's a hundred thousand dollars." So then he's like. You need to give me $100,000, I'll let off all the passengers, and then I'm going to take the plane away again. And they're like, you know what, alright, deal. So, he, they, he has the pilot land the plane, right? And then the police are there, or whatever, and they make the exchange. He lets out all the passengers, with the exception of a flight attendant and the pilot. And um, they give him a bag full of cash, $100 bills, and... Uh, the plane takes off again and they get over what I believe is like some of the western states like Colorado, Montana, something like that. And he takes a parachute and jumps up and he was never seen again. Not bad. Not bad. Okay. So it was, it was a dark and stormy night. On November 24th, 1971, it was the day before Thanksgiving and it you can hear Milo meowing. <laughs> So this guy named Dan Cooper bought a $20 ticket from Northwest Orient Airlines at Portland International Airlines. And he went, or airport, I don't know why I wrote airlines twice. And he, it was a one-way ticket to Seattle. And so at this time, you didn't need an ID to buy a ticket. You just told them your name. There was no security, all that. Boards of Boeing 727 sat in seat 18C, so he was kind of in the back, ordered a bourbon and soda, which is important to the description of him. Now, what flight attendants and other passengers described him as was a man in his mid-40s, between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot, brown I, eyes, dark hair. I remember hair. how they figured out who it was. He said this one word, right? 
And they, from that, like, how he describes something, they're like, yeah, that's him. Like... You, okay, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Yeah, because so, they're like, this guy is so intelligent that he's the only way that he, that he's the only person that would speak like that. Yeah. He, he, okay, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get yeah, there. We'll it's, get there. it's all coming back You're, to me. That, that, <laughs> you that, seem that, really excited. That History Channel show that I watched, like, seven years ago. I watched an Nat Geo documentary, but anyway. Oh, yeah, so my sources for this while I'm here are this, uh, it's called Skyjacked. It was a National Geographic documentary. And then also the BuzzFeed Unsolved did it as well. And then the some other details were from Wikipedia. So he also had a swarthy skin, which is also described as an olive tone skin tone because I had to Google that. He wore a l- black lightweight raincoat, loafers, a dark suit, a neatly pressed white collared shirt, a black clip-on tie with a mother of pearl tie pin. And he had an attache case. I don't really know what that is. It just opens up like it to show you products, I guess. Yeah, yeah, because people thought he was traveling salesman. So uh, shortly after takeoff, uh, Cooper handed a note to Florence Schaefer Schna- Schaffner. I think she was one of the flight attendants, and she thought he was just flirting with her, so she didn't look at it, and she put it in her purse or pocket. There's. Some people say one thing, some people say another. And then once he saw that she hadn't read it yet, he told her, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. So what the note said, they don't exactly know because later in the flight, he took back the note, but it was neat, all capital letters with a felt tip pen. Schaffner said that, basically said that he had a bomb in his briefcase and he told her to sit behind, beside him. When she sat there, she asked to see the bomb and he showed her and it just basically looked like eight red cylinders, like four on top of four, attached to wires coated with red insulation and a large cylindrical battery. Now, in his note, he demanded $200,000, but he didn't specify how he wanted it, like whether it was 10s or 20s. He also demanded four parachutes and then a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the aircraft upon arrival. Florence went and told the pilots she came back. He was wearing his sunglasses, which became really famous because it's a lot of, you know, those drawings of him. Mm-hmm. The pilot's name was William Scott, and he told C- Seattle Tacoma Airport and their air traffic control what was going on. They told the FBI. They, the, no one knew what was going on. Like none of the passengers was just really low key. Once they got to Seattle, which there was like a delay, they're like, oh, we're going to have to circle because of the storm. There's something going on. There's mechanical difficulties. We can't land right away. They're getting the money. Yep. They're getting the money while that was happening. Once, so they circled for two hours and they started to get the parachutes for him as well. I forgot why I wanted four. I remember there being a specific reason. Why? It's like unclear. He ended up only taking two which I'll get to, but I think part of it was like, I'll get to it when we get there. (laughs) Once, when they were like getting around that area, the flight attendant said that he appeared really familiar with the area. He even said, looks like Tacoma down there. And he mentioned that the McCord Air Force Base was really close. So it was like these little details that seemed like, okay, he knows the area. He knows the Air Force Base. These are things that pointed him toward either he works maybe in the air, like airplane, airplane, ports or just the air force some sort of military something along those lines he didn't have a distinguishable accent he was calm polite well spoken seemed very intelligent they said he even wasn't nervous he seemed really nice he wasn't cruel or nasty never said anything rude wasn't really pushy you know despite having a bomb he even paid his drink tab and attempted to like tip the waitress or the flight attendants while they were there offered to request meals for the flight crew during the stop in seattle so it was really weird and like how he was acting was just really calm kind of cocky the fbi noted the serial numbers on the money that they got for him so they could track it later and then the flight landed in seattle at 5 39 he was given the money and the passengers and some of the flight attendants were released one flight okay i think it ended up being five people stayed on the flight the two pilots the a flight attendant maybe two flight attendants and then the engineer so all of those people were on it with him Now, while it was being refueled, he told the cockpit crew his plan. So he wanted to go to Mexico. And when he wanted to go, he wanted to go basically as slow as possible, around 115 miles per hour at a maximum of 10,000 feet in the air. He specified that he wanted the landing gear to remain deployed during in the takeoff landing position with the wing flaps lowered to 15 degrees because and this the reason he asked for that specifically is because when the flaps are lowered like that it prevents the plane from going fast like it has to stay below 200 miles per hour and the cabin remain unpressurized which that part gets confusing later 
so he clearly knows planes. Exactly. So that like, was like a big thing. It's like he obviously knows planes. He knows enough to request these specific things mm -hmm. because he knows like the conditions that he would be jumping under. What year was this? 71. Okay. So William Radisek, who's the co-pilot, told him that because they don't have don't, because of the flight configuration and the refueling and everything like that, that they would have to refuel before going to Mexico. And they gave him some options and they agreed on Reno. And he was like, okay, yeah, that sounds fine. Now, the plane's rear exit door and its staircase extended so that the rear exit door was open and the staircase was extended. And then Cooper directed the pilot to take off. But they were like, no, you can't take off because it's unsafe to have the staircase down, obviously. And then Cooper countered that it was indeed safe, but he would not argue the point. And they lower and because he lowered it once it was airborne. At approximately 7.40, the Boeing took off with the five people aboard. Okay, so here it is. Cooper, pilot, William Scott, flight attendant, uh, Tina Mucklow, co-pilot, Radicek, and then a flight engineer, H.E. Anderson. Also, this is like never mentioned anywhere else, but the plane was followed. So it was followed by two F-106 fighter aircrafts, which they came from the Air Force Base nearby, followed behind it, one above it and one below, out of Cooper's view, a Lockheed T-33 trainer diverted from an unrelated National Guard mission, also shadowed it, and it, but it ran out of fuel, and so it had to leave. And then there were five planes in total trailing the hijacked plane, but not a single one of them saw him jump, and none could pinpoint where the jump happened. Once takeoff happened, Cooper made the he told the flight attendant to go into the cockpit and like on her way there, she turned around and saw him taking apart these parachute bags. And one of them, he was like cutting the strings on. It looked like he was wrapping something around his waist and it, it was the bundle of money. That's what like they're thinking. And then like after she went into there, nobody really knows what happened at that point in time. But around 8 p.m., a warning light flashed in the cockpit saying that like the stairs were down. So they like... Did a little announcement to him asking him if he needed anything. And then about 10 minutes later, they noticed a really big change in the cabin pressure. And so this is when they assumed that he opened the door and jumped. So around that time. And then FBI, after landing, the FBI like immediately began their investigation after they landed in Reno. And he wasn't there, obviously. They found his tie clip. His with. OK, they found his tie clip, his clip on tie. Two of the four parachutes are still there. Eight cigarette and eight cigarette butts. And the FBI immediately began doing interviews on everybody so they started out with a list of like a thousand people and it quickly went to about a dozen milo you cannot lay there so the first person of interest was a man named was an oregon man named db cooper who had a minor police record and the only reason he was a, the first person of interest was because his name was db cooper but he, even though the person who performed the hijacking went by dan cooper now, he was contacted by Portland police just to, like, ask him, see if maybe there was something going on. He was really quickly ruled out. However, there was a local reporter named James Long, who he was just trying to meet deadlines, so he posted, he wrote an article using D.B. Cooper's name. And then a wire service reporter uh, republished the air, and it just kept being republished. And so that's how it became D.B. Cooper, even though the hijacker used the name Dan Cooper. So there's something for that. Now, I feel bad for D.B. Cooper. I know. I was just thinking that, like, poor D.B. Cooper. Yeah, for the rest of his life, and be like, you, are you the guy that did the hijacking? He's like, no, that was Dan. But I was interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just just imagine, like, couple couple you know years down the line, let's say 10, 15 years, and the guy's just like out trying to you know like buy something from the grocery store, needs to see some ID or something, and uh, the person just looks at his ID and it says D.B. Cooper on it, like. That, that store person's going to freak the fuck out. I doubt out. that there, it would be D.B. Cooper. He probably just goes by his initials. So it'd be like... I suppose. Dan Brian Cooper. Yeah, but I know a few people whose names are their initials. Like, but like legally, like it would be on an ID as D.B. Yeah, like J.D. I don't think J.D. is... <laughs> license says J.D. on it. Well, I, I knew a guy who was that. It's my cousin. He goes by JD? Yeah. I, I think. think. No, he did. It's but, like, it's his legal name. I think so. I don't... I don't think so. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Okay, anyway. So, their search is on for Dan Cooper. Now, they... The plane was on autopilot, so using that and around the time the um, air pressure changed, they believe... 
that it was somewhere near Ariel Washington, which, by the way, in Ariel Washington, there's a little bar there. And every year on like the Saturday after Thanksgiving, they have a huge D.B. Cooper party. So they using that, they created a 28 square mile, ra- scare mile, square mile radius. And they searched on foot and helicopter. And the FBI also did an aerial search along the entire flight path. They couldn't really find anything. But they also found later that the original landing zone estimate was inaccurate because Scott, the pilot, was flying the aircraft manually because of Cooper's speed and altitude demands. So they really don't really know. Like, it was farther east than they originally thought, so they don't know exactly where it was. Then so, why did they assume that it was on autopilot? Because it usually was. Like, usually the flight at that time, like, it's on autopilot, so we're just going to follow it. But he, he was trying to follow the path, but he just, because he, it couldn't, he wasn't able to follow the path and follow D.B. Cooper's specifications. That could have been wrong with their estimates, and the actual drop zone was probably close to the Washougal River. There's only been a few, according to this, four pieces of evidence, two definite and two potential. One is in 1978, so this was a little bit later, a placard printed with instructions for lowering the the stairs of a 727 was found by a deer hunter near Logging Road, about 13 miles east of Cass Rock, Washington, well north of Lake Merwin, but within Flight 305's basic flight path. Then, in February of 1980, so this is nine years after the incident, a kid named Brian Ingram, was eight years old at the time, him and his family were having a vacation, and then at a beachfront known as Tina Bar, which is close to Vancouver, Washington, he found a bag full of $20 bills that were, like, moldy and old. They were super disintegrated. But the FBI looked at them and they were able to figure out, looking through a portion of them, that it was the same serial numbers as the ones that D.B. Cooper took. In the bag, there was it was $5,800. I think it's $5,800. I didn't write it down, but I'm pretty sure it was $5,800. Okay, and then in 2017, a group of volunteer investigators believe what they found to be potential evidence of what could be a parachute strap in the Pacific Northwest. And then also a piece of foam. And then another thing, which I actually edited out, was they found a body, but it was, like, super clearly not his. Like, it was a girl. So, yeah. So, some things that they've taken into consideration to identify him is the primary shoe. So, they gave him four shoots, and he chose two to take with him. The first one, his primary shoe, was this, like, super old shoe that was not very good. And the other option was a sport one. Now, the sport one, he could steer. The old one, he couldn't have steered. And then for the backup, he chose a training or a dummy one, one that wasn't even usable. Like, it was sewed shut. The way they explain it is that that dummy one, like, if you were knew anything about parachuting, you would know that that was a training one and that one wasn't usable at all. So the fact that he chose one that was really hard to use and manage, especially in, like, these crazy storms in at, the, at night that he can't steer using that one instead of a sport one, which he at least could steer, they're like, obviously, he has no idea what he's doing. And also, they made a big deal about the fact that he, what he jumped in, like his clothing and the fact that he was wearing loafers. So I, apparently it's really hard to skydive in loafers. So also they found particles on his tie. So this included this team, which were called the uh, citizen sleuths. So Tom K was a paleontolo- is a paleontologist, sorry. And then there's some other people, but they found lycopodium spores, bismuth, al- aluminum, and then also titanium on his tie. So... This, at the time, those could only be found in metal fabrication or production facilities or at chemical companies using it. So what they think is that he could have been a chemist, a metallurgist, or possibly an engineer or manager in a medical, in a metal or chemical manufacturing plant, which one of the rare applications for such elements at that time was Boeing's supersonic transport development project, Successing, suspecting that he could have been a Boeing employee. What were you going to say? Let's roll this back a little bit. So the FBI gave him a faulty shoot knowing They didn't well. do it on purpose. They talk about it later that because they literally, it was such a scramble. They're like, just get any shoots we can because because he asked for four, they didn't know why he asked for four. They thought he might um, basically take hostages with him. Yeah, make people jump with so him. So they yeah. didn't want to do that, but that was like a complete accident that they gave him the dummy shoe. And then I don't think they realized it until it was too late. Then how do they, if he took it with him as his backup, how do they know that that shoe was a dummy one? 
who identified it as. I'm not sure. That is a good question, though, because it's like somebody had to know beforehand. Maybe as they were bringing in and a guy was like, hey, this is not right. What? And well, in the documentary I watched, they interviewed the guy who packed the parachute bags. And he knew all about them. And he was like, I don't understand why he'd take this crappy old one when there's a sleek new one here. There has to be a reason behind it. Yeah. I don't think it's due to the fact that he was a novice parachuter. I think it may have been to throw off the FBI. Yeah. I like think maybe like, I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, this is fine. Everything about Dan Cooper seems to be that he knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. I agree. So I don't, you know, I don't think that, you know. Which I think is part of why the FBI, well, the FBI ended up closing this case in 2016, giving it up about saying who it was because, and I think that um, it's part of it is because the FBI, like, which is what I'm about to get into. So the chief investigator for this was Ralph Himmelsbach. And he had this idea, and he said these in interviews, about Dan Cooper. And he was like, this guy is a crook. He's a criminal. He's a lowlife. Like, he's desperate. He's not, you know, he's not this high-class guy that everybody thinks he is. He's just, he's stupid. He's, like, idiotic. He said, like, all this stuff. But people are like, you need to give him more credit. He got away with it. So, but he wanted to label... This because a lot of people hear the D.B. Cooper story and they're like, oh, it's like real life James Bond. And like nobody got hurt in it and everything like that. And he got away with all this money. But he's like, no, 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 don't you. Well, think about think it. Of this great thing. If you're if you're a police chief or an FBI agent, you want to say that this guy was super, super advanced and skillful. So the dumb people don't try it. Yeah. Like if he's like, wow, this guy's a low life. This guy's super dumb. Everybody's going to be like, oh, I can do that. Like, D.B. Cooper did it, and he was a nobody, so mm-hmm. I could do it. But if, if, everyone we'll thinks, if everyone thinks that he's James Bond, then, you know, no one's going to be like, oh, I'm James freaking Bond. I can do this, you know. I mean, maybe. I mean, that, that does sound pretty well, cool. Well, here's the thing, though. So um, there is this book. It's a Belgium comic book series, but it's also available in Canada called Dan Cooper. It's about Dan Cooper, a Royal Canadian Air Force test pilot who took part in numerous heroic adventures, including parachuting. So and it's so it's also available in Canada. So a lot of people think, well, maybe he was Canadian and that's why he was here. Other people think that maybe he was um, in the in the military but went abroad to europe while he was there stumbled upon these comic books so people think it's an alias well yeah i mean yeah pretty clearly yeah Yeah, so because these books were never well they were never imported into the u.s so you could only get them in canada or europe and it was pretty close to what it was so it's like obviously somebody's just copying it now, yeah, so the FBI, they're really skeptical. They said that Cooper lacked crucial skydiving skills and experience. That first they thought he was super experienced, but then, like, once they looked into the parachuting thing and the what he was wearing and the fact that it was pitch black at night and it was storming and there was a bunch of clouds and it was still going very fast, like, still, you wouldn't skydive under these conditions at all. They just don't think he was a professional skydiver. And the FBI actually thinks he died from the jump even though they didn't recover anything other than that little bag of money in 1980. Okay, so the bag of money, originally they thought he landed and buried it there, and there were more bags of money, so they dug all around there, didn't find anything. But what now they believe happened, also that area had been, um, what's the word? Dr- not drudged. Slut. When they like search an area and they put like a net through it, and they, I, I don't know. You know all what I'm, I'm talking about, all though? I'm, all I'm thinking of um, is space balls when they're like, comb the desert, and then... Oh, they, they have a giant comb? Yeah. And Basically, it's yeah. that, but in a river. So they usually do it for crime scene investigations to find bodies, or I in think, this case, to find I, money. I think that's a space balls thing. But that had been done in, in 74, so they were like, well, obviously this cash was planted after 74, but what they think is it actually fell into like another area of water, and then it just went there through a tributary and so they're then they that's why they're like well maybe he landed in water and then if he landed in water it was cold and he definitely would have died and so the fbi still thinks he's dead that whole thing so let's talk about the suspect so who do you think did it i think do you know the name of course i don't know the fucking name (laughs) 
so I I think it he was uh, uh the the guy working on the Boeing seven forty sevens. Okay, so there's a lot. Uh, his his Wikipedia, tie checks out. The Wikipedia page lists thirteen people. It could be. I'm only going to talk about the three, which are like usually the three big ones. The first one is Richard McCoy. Richard Mc- Floyd McCoy Jr. So he was an army vet and was a demolition expert, Green Berets, helicopter pilot. You know, he has that. He was military experience, piloting, blah, blah. And he was a, a recreational skydiver. Now, he, a year later, well, I guess it wasn't even a year later. It was like six months later. It was in April of 1972. He staged basically a copycat hijacking of D.B. Coopers. So he boarded a United Airlines flight 855 in Denver, Colorado, and he had a. Pa- it was ended up being a paperweight, resembling a hand grenade, and an unloaded handgun. He demanded four parachutes and five hundred thousand dollars. After delivery of the money and the parachutes at San Francisco Airport, he ordered the aircraft back into the sky and bailed out over Provo, Utah, leaving behind his handwritten hijacking instructions and his fingerprints on a magazine which he had been reading. So he wasn't careful like DB Cooper was. Like DB Cooper took basically as much as he could, except for he left his tie. Yeah, why did he leave his tie? So it wouldn't get in his face, maybe, while he was skydiving. Eventually, you can always just clip it to like your belt or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, McCoy was arrested they found him based on like everything and in his notes and he was went to prison for 45 years but they figured out that he wasn't actually him because he was he had an alibi for the db cooper thing but uh just some little side note interesting thing about him is he went he after going to prison he escaped two years later and then he was killed in a shootout with fbi agents so Now, this is the next one is the one I think it is. And I think this is also the one you think it is. This is Kenneth Christensen. So Lyle Christensen is Kenneth Christensen's brother. And he watched a D.B. Cooper documentary in 2003. And then he immediately thought, this is my brother. But his brother had already been dead at the time. Oh, he died of cancer. So Kenny Christensen enlisted in the army in 1944 and was trained as a paratrooper. And I watched the Brad Meltzer's Decoded episode on D.B. Cooper, or at least the first half of it. And they talk, they interview Lyle Christensen. And he talks about how his brother had training to basically be able to do parachuting in any condition. So in the worst conditions, in the best conditions, be able to land on trees, be able to deal with faulty parachutes, all this stuff. I think part of that makes him more convincing because with that, if, if he grabbed the crappy parachute, he would know what he was doing, but he would also know how to handle a crappy parachute. So yeah. I think that supports it. I mean, maybe that parachute was more like the one that yeah, maybe he, that's was what used he was used to. to. Like maybe he didn't parachute with hand, you know, gliding ones. Like mm-hmm. or and maybe the faulty one or the dummy one. Like maybe since he had all this practice, n- made it so that he could, you know, change it into it. one. Like yeah. make it usable. I don't know how faulty parachutes work, but you know maybe those are the two that he was most comfortable with. And if Mm -hmm. he had all this parachuting experience, then, you know, that's what he would do. So after he left the army, he joined Northwest Orient as a, in 1954 as a mechanic in the South Pacific. And he became a flight attendant later. And then a purser, which I don't know what that is. He was, he was 45 years old at the time of the hijacking, but he was a little bit shorter, five foot eight. So not like that much out of it. I mean, just put lifts in his shoes or something. And he was a little bit thinner than what they expected, but also he didn't have hair during that time. However, Christensen wore a toupee until this, uh, until after this event. Then he stopped wearing his toupee randomly. So I don't know. That could be something. Now, also, he was left-handed, which they figured out that Cooper's... Okay, so it, they figured out from his tie that Cooper was left-handed, or they believe he was left-handed. He seemed to favor it. And then also... Um, well, you could tell that from, like, him smoking. Yeah, that too. And then also Christensen preferred bourbon as his drink. And when they showed pictures of him to uh, the flight attendant, she said that it looked like him... It looked like D.B. Cooper more than any other pictures of people she had seen. A few months after the hijacking, he supposedly had bought a house with cash. But actually, they figured out that that wasn't true. Um, He uh, literally took out a mortgage. So it was that and he paid it off over 17 years. 
So it wasn't like he just paid for it all. However, his family discovered gold coins in a valuable stamp collection, along with over $200,000 in his bank accounts. And they found a folder of Northwest Orient news clippings, which began when he was hired, and they stopped just prior to the date of the hijacking. So he had all these news clippings from his job. They also seemed that he wasn't happy with his job. Like, they were known for having a bunch of strikes in that company throughout the years and so his it, the income was never consistent and it was never predictable so it could have been like an act of revenge on the company too but his brother Lyle Christensen said that while his brother was dying of cancer in 1994 he told him that there's something he said in a quote there's something you should know but I cannot tell you so Lyle after five learning about the D.B. Cooper thing he just assumed it was that so that's him and then the last one which People nowadays are like set on. They say this is him. This is the guy. Even like there's a bunch of articles about him. This you, guy. You mentioned one I was saying at the beginning that you knew what I was talking about when I said he said something specifically, and that's how they knew specifically who it was. Well, now is that who? Who? Which one was that? Well, part of it was McCoy because he copied. He copied a lot of the letters and the way he talked about it, but also just the way he discussed the flights, like. The spe- flight specifics pointed at people. No, that's flight. not what I'm talking about. Oh, well, then I don't know what you're talking about. No, well, you need to watch that thing that I watched a little oh. while ago. Okay. Good, good to know. Good to know. Now, this you're last... not an expert like this. Like, <laughs> this like last guy is Robert Rackstraw. So this is like the guy, according I love, to I people. I love these guys' names. Mick Flagon or whatever. It was... McCoy? <laughs> well, Mick and then something, something, something. Something, something. The Richard first... Floyd McCoy Jr. <laughs> or C- Kenneth Christensen. It was the first, the first guy, the first suspect. Yeah, Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. Oh, oh yeah, Richard Floyd McCoy. Duh. And then this is Robert Rackstraw. So Robert Ra- Wesley Rackstraw is a retired pilot and an ex-convict who served on an army helicopter crew and other units during the Vietnam War. So the Cooper Task Force became aware of him in 1978 and after he was arrested in Iran and deported to the U.S. because of uh, explosive possessions. Then, while he was released on bail, he attempted to fake his own death by radioing a false mayday and telling controllers that he was bailing out of a rented plane over Monterey Bay. He was also arrested in Fullerton on an additional charge of forging federal pilot certificates. They said that he... Well, Cooper investigators noted his physical resemblance to Cooper... Even though he was t- only 28 at the time of the D.B. Cooper incident, but he had military parachute training and a criminal record. But they, but the FBI eliminated him as a suspect in '79 because they couldn't find any direct evidence of his his involvement. What does that even mean? Basically, they couldn't find anything. Like they didn't know where he was that day, but they don't know if he was there. They don't have an alias. They don't have like DNA to link him to it. They don't say like, oh well, he he ended up with all this money. They don't. They don't know. In 2016, he emerged as a suspect in a History Channel program and a book. Now, in Thomas Colbert, Thomas Colbert, an author of the book Last Master Outlaw, filed a lawsuit to get the Cooper case file under the Freedom of Information Act. And he claims that the FBI suspended active investigation of the Cooper case in order to undermine the theory that Rackstraw is D.B. Cooper. Because basically, the FBI were too embarrassed about dismissing him in 1979, even though he was him. And that's why they closed the case was because people were starting to dig around and be like, you missed this guy. And so that's basically what the Rackstraw thing is. In, 19, in December of 1971, there was a letter written to New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Seattle Times, and Washington Post with numerous numbers and letters written on it. So this team, led by Tom and Donna Colbert, says that the codes were deciphered and matched to three units that Rackstraw was a part of while in the Army, and the FBI refused to acknowledge it because it would have to admit that amateur sleuths had cracked a case that the Bureau couldn't. So that was part of it as well, is that it's basically the FBI is embarrassed and doesn't want to do anything. That's the main thing. And then also one of the Flight 305 attendants reportedly did not find any similarities between photos of Rackstra from the 1970s and her collection, her recollection of Cooper's appearance. Rackstra's attorney called the renewed allegations the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and Rackstra himself told people that it's a, it's, it's a lot of ex- expletive. Insert expletive here. That's what it says. And they know it. So, But the FBI refused to comment. And Rackstra stated in 2017 that he lost his job over these 2016 alleg- investigations. So... 
they don't really know. A lot of people nowadays think it's him. And people have interviewed him and stuff like that. And they're just set on it being him, basically. And there's even a Rolling Stone, art- Rolling Stone article talking about him as well. But I still think it's Kenneth Christensen, personally. I mean, if you've seen the fabulous documentary... Um... <laughs> But I'm like I said, there's ten. I mean, uh, just on Wikipedia alone, there's ten other yeah. suspects no. that are investigated on there. So these are, but these are just the main ones that are usually brought up. If you've seen the fabulous documentary without a paddle, it's not a documentary. You will, have, you will have known what happened. So, so DB Cooper and Burt Reynolds jump out of a plane together. They were together. They're in cahoots. Yeah, and um, on all these it says he had no accomplices. Yeah. Have you watched the movie? I it's don't think so. So then now, they they land right, but then they fall into like an old mine shaft, and it's it's cold down there in the in the west. So DB Cooper dies on impact, right? And then Burt Reynolds eats him. No, 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 no. Oh, no. sorry. So um, Donner party's talking. He, about since it's so cold, burns his half of the money. His own half. But since it wasn't his, he never, you know, could he couldn't get himself to burn D.B. Cooper's. But he eventually gets out, sets up a cabin, and lives out there until these three friends come along and they're like, hey, you know what's going on with this whole D.B. Cooper case. That's a huge spoiler for Without a Paddle. It's fine. So then, <laughs> like you said, it came out like 15 years ago. Warning, there's going to be spoilers for Without a Paddle. Great, great documentary. And then... <laughs> it's not a documentary. And then, at the end, since Dak Shepard um, is poor, Burt Reynolds gives it to the three friends, and the other two friends, who are more well-off, give all the money to him. And the only thing is he has to like cut off his pinky toe or something. So... And that's a true story of how no, Jack Shepard was, became was, rich and famous. It was his left nut. Yeah. No, it wasn't. Yes. Nuh-uh. Yes. They wouldn't put that in a movie. Yeah. It was like PG-13. He said he, he'll bet his left testicle. I'm pretty sure that that was the bet. I don't think so. Look it up. Google. Oh, um, yeah, left nut. I bet you my 100, 100 grand on my left nut. Yeah, because it's... Dan, it was Dan Ma. I don't know who he is. I bet you 100 grand on my left night that all you catch in the river is a cold. Yeah, because it's Seth Green's character. And then he caught a fish. You owe me 100 grand and, and the left nut. Yeah, yeah, because... That's, that has nothing to do with the money. That has to well, do with the fish. Well, well that's, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. They Seth Green gives him his portion of the money, and they're like, yeah, that's about 100 grand right there. And then uh, he's like, well... You made good on that part of the bet. Then he pulls out a little pocket knife, and he starts chasing him around. So he doesn't actually cut off his left nut, though. No, they they, they do. That's well. I mean, the movie ends it ambiguously. <laughs> so you can you can decide whether or not he yeah, he, yeah. he gets his left nut. That's that's or he what keeps it that's what good it. documentaries end on is a good thinker. You know. Is a what? A good thinker. Oh, I thought you said a good finger. I'm like, it's a nut. No. A good thinker. Okay. So, yeah, if him and the... Back to real D.B. Cooper. Him and the engineer were in cahoots together. Why else would the engineer be there? I don't know. I'm not a pilot. Exactly. I'm not not a pilot. It must have been the Brad Meltzer's Decoded that I was watching. In there, they, they, they figure it out who it was. I, why did that show get canceled? I don't know. The dude Probably because of conspiracy. And the government just wanted to shut that shit down. The, okay, next week's is the conspiracy <laughs> The conspiracy about, of Brad Meltzer's decoded getting shut down. <laughs> yeah, by by the government. Because do he it. was asking too many questions. Pretty much. <sighs> okay. So, if you want to follow on social media, there's we have Instagram, which is at podcast HMCT, no, HMCT podcast. Twitter is pod, at podcast HMCT. Also, I have a website, which I'm slowly working at updating, so it's actually up to date. And that's historiesmysteriesconspiracies.com. But that has show notes and links and stuff, easily shareable stuff. Yeah. And also on Twitter every week, I post like a hint at next week's episode. And Instagram just has other fun stuff. 
and comics and memes and all that good stuff. What's, what's the hint for next week's episode? Oh, well, the, the hint I had for this episode, it's a guy diving into a bathtub. It's pretty funny. Um, I didn't want it to be too obvious. What's the hint for next week's episode? I don't know what next week's episode is. But, okay, do those things and be your weird self. Bye.